Welcome to the History Obscura Reading Room. Today's tale is a dark one, full of some rather bloody details. Be warned. Once upon a time, in 1888, some of the world's most infamous serial murders took place in the district of Whitechapel in London, England. Though city police did not at first consider the gruesome mutilations of several female sex workers to be related, it soon became apparent, however, that the careful and very specific damage done to the bodies of the victims could only have been the work of one deranged killer. There are five women whose deaths are considered by contemporary police and modern researchers to have been almost certainly killed by the same psychopath, and the first of these was Polly Nichols. Polly's body was reportedly discovered at about 3.40 a.m. on August 31, 1888. She was discovered by two carmen, or as we might call them, delivery drivers with carts. Charles Cross was the first car man to reach Polly, whom he found in front of a gated horse stable entrance on Bucks Row, Whitechapel. Her skirts were pulled up to her waist. The second witness, Robert Paul, saw Cross standing over Polly and came to see what was the matter. Cross claimed that he had found the woman lying there and that he believed she was dead. Robert Paul, however, checked Polly's face for some signs of life and thought perhaps there was the faintest breath. The men repositioned Polly's skirt so that her lower half was covered, then moved on down the road where they met Police Constable Jonas Midson. The carman directed Midzen back towards a lady lying in the road. Some reports state that Charles Cross also told PC Midzen that there was another policeman already on the scene. And this is a detail that really changes everything about Jack the Ripper. You see, minutes after the carman left Polly, her body was discovered by PC John Neal, while passing through Buck's Row on his usual police route. Shining his lantern down onto the woman, Neil could immediately make out a large puddle of blood that had seeped out from the woman's throat. The puddle had apparently not been there moments earlier, or at least it hadn't been large enough for the carmen to see. It makes sense that, if Charles Cross had merely been passing a message from one policeman to another, that he and Paul not be held for questioning as potential witnesses to a violent act. Otherwise, why did PC Mizzen let them continue on their way to work? Polly Nichols' throat had been deeply severed in two locations, so deeply that she was nearly decapitated. Her lower abdomen was cut open by one deep, jagged wound, and several other cuts had been made across her stomach. A doctor, summoned to the scene by police, confirmed that Polly was indeed dead when he arrived to examine her 30 minutes after the discovery of her body. He noted, however, that she must have died within minutes of having been found. Though Charles Cross, as the first witness had identified himself to P.C. Mizzen, had not been asked to stay for questioning on the day of Polly Nichols' murder, he was eventually brought to the attention of the investigative team at London's Metropolitan Police Office in the local district. In the process of gathering more witnesses and collecting official statements, the police found Cross and brought him in. This particular witness did not give his address, as was expected of each witness on record. He also gave the police a different name than he had originally stated, Charles Allen Leshmere. Leshmere turned out to have been the name of Charles's birth father, 
while Cross was the name of one of his stepfathers. Leshmere had grown up with his mother and a series of stepfathers. Born in London's East End, Leshmere moved many times as a child. By the time of the murders, he was 39 years old, married, and had fathered 12 children. He always lived with or near his mother, even throughout his adulthood. However, two months before the Ripper killings began, Leshmere moved out of his mother's house, leaving his eldest daughter in her care. He took up residence by himself in Doveton Street. Leshmere's work as a meat delivery driver was located in Broad Street, which meant that after his move, the route to work in the early hours of the morning took him directly through Whitechapel at about 3.30 a.m. Monday to Friday. As a deliverer of meat, Leshmere would have looked completely normal in an apron covered in blood. In fact, the Broad Street Station had a space for workers such as him to clean themselves up between deliveries and after work. Given that the streets of the Bucks Row murder scene are exactly the same now as they were then, Christer Holmgren, a Swedish journalist, and criminologist Gareth Norris walked the route from Leshmere's home in Doveton Street to the location of Nichols' body and found a nine-minute discrepancy in the first witness's story. Charles Leshmere would most likely have had several minutes alone with Polly before Robert Paul spotted him standing over the body. Though she is not considered one of the canonical five victims attributed to Jack the Ripper, one Martha Tabram was also murdered just a few weeks before Polly Nichols. Tabram's body was first discovered around 3.30 a.m. on August 7th, this time by carman George Crow. Crow was returning home from work, and in the dark, he assumed Tabron has passed out from drinking. Tabron remained there until about 5 a.m. when another resident of the building saw her and in the early light could tell that she had been the victim of a serious assault. Martha Tabron had been stabbed 39 times, dying in George Yard at around the very same time that Charles Leshmere would have been passing nearby on his way to work. Still, Polly Nichols is considered Jack the Ripper's first victim. Next was Annie Chapman, who died in Hanbury Street at about 5.30 in the morning of September 8th. Albert Kadosh, who lived at 27 Hanbury Street, told investigators that when he awoke early to go to the lavatory, he heard a woman in the yard saying no followed by what sounded like a body falling against the fence. Soon afterwards, she was found dead by delivery carter John Davis. Her throat had been cut in a similar way to Polly Nichols, and her abdomen ripped entirely open, her innards rearranged. Her womb was missing. Double murder day came in the early hours of September 30th, near midnight. This time, the victim, Elizabeth Stride, was discovered south of the Whitechapel Road, near the very houses in which Leshmere had spent much of his childhood. Indeed, his mother and eldest daughter lived in that very neighborhood. Stride's murder is believed to have been cut short, as she was only cut once along her throat. A mere 40 minutes later, in nearby Mitre Square, the body of Catherine Eddowes was discovered. This time, the killer had enough time to remove her womb and one kidney. It was on October 16th of 1888 that the president of the Whitechapel Vigilance Committee, George Lusk, 
received a three-inch square cardboard box in the mail. He opened it to find a human kidney preserved in wine, along with a letter that looked as if it may have been written in blood. That letter read as follows. From hell, Mr. Lusk, Sor, I send you half the kidney I took from one woman and preserved it for you. T'other piece I fried and ate. Was very nice. I may send you the bloody knife that took it out, if you only wait a while longer. Signed, Catch Me When You Can, Mr. Lusk. The people of London blamed the police force for the continued murders since they seemed incapable of apprehending any solid suspects in the case. Many formed vigilante neighborhood watch groups. Thousands of women signed a petition to Queen Victoria herself, calling for action. The petition was sent on October 26th and said, To our most gracious sovereign Lady Queen Victoria, Madam, we, the women of East London, feel horror at the dreadful sins that have been lately committed in our midst and grief because of the blame that has fallen on our neighborhood. By the facts which have come out in the inquest, we have learnt much of the lives of those of our sisters who have lost a firm hold on goodness, and who are leading sad and degraded lives. While each woman of us will do all she can to make men feel with horror the sins of impurity which cause such wicked lives to be led, we would also beg that your majesty will call on your servants in authority and bid them to put the law, which already exists, into motion to close bad houses within those walls such wickedness is done, and men and women ruined in body and soul. We are, madam, your loyal and humble servants. It was not until another gruesome murder took place on November 9th that the Queen's response became quite public. This time, the victim was Mary Ann Kelly, whose body was found completely torn apart in her own lodging room at 13 Miller's Court. Her landlord discovered the scene through the window when he came to collect her overdue rent. Forensic analysts concluded that the killer must have been alone in that room for hours in order to conduct so thorough a dismemberment of his victim's body. The thing obviously missing from the piles of dismembered flesh and organs was Marianne's heart. A neighbor later described a man she had seen enter the room that night as short, stout, with a blotchy face. He looked to be in his thirties. He had a short, carroty mustache, a billycock hat, a longish, dark, shabby coat, and a quart pail of beer. After Kelly's murder, the Queen sent a blunt message to the Prime Minister. This new and most ghastly murder shows the absolute necessity for some very decided action. All these courts must be lit, and our detectives improved. They are not what they should be. You promised, when the first murder took place, to consult with your colleagues about it. Home Secretary Henry Matthews received his own royal message, which said, the Queen fears that the detective department is not so efficient as it might be. No doubt the recent murders in Whitechapel were committed in circumstances which made detection very difficult. Still, the Queen thinks that, in the small area where these horrible crimes have been perpetrated, a great number of detectives might be employed, and that every possible suggestion might be carefully examined and if practicable, followed. Have the cattle boats and passenger boats been examined? Has any investigation been made as to the number of single men occupying rooms themselves? 
The murderer's clothes must be saturated with blood and must be kept somewhere. Is there sufficient surveillance at night? These are some of the questions that occur to the Queen on reading the accounts of this horrible crime. By Christmas time of 1888, London's police had stopped their reinforcement of the Whitechapel district, which perhaps only leads to more questions. Some 11 or 12 murders, depending who you ask, have been attributed to the same person, that elusive Jack the Ripper. All took place between April 3rd, 1888 and February 13th, 1892. And all, including an unidentified victim known only as the Pynchon Street Torso, were within close proximity of Whitechapel Road. Collectively, these have come to be known as the Whitechapel Murders. Charles Allen Leshmere lived to the age of 71, dying on the 23rd of December, 1920. Unlike many of the non-royal men suspected of being Jack the Ripper, we can actually look upon the face of Charles Leshmere, thanks to a photograph he had taken of himself in 1912. You can see that on our Twitter feed at HistObscuraPod or at HistoryObscuraPodcast.com. Thank you for listening to this particularly gruesome story, friends. Do let me know if you are interested in hearing more tales like this from my collection, and I'll see what I can do to satisfy your bloodthirsty interests. Good night. Good night.